So the outline for today's lecture is as follows. So first, we are, we are simply taking some little baby steps. So we just talked about individual choice two weeks ago. Now we are adding several decision makers. Now we want to talk about choice based on the preferences of multiple voters. Um, we will then first restrict attention to the case of only two different alternatives. Um, that will be interesting enough for a while. Um, and there we will have some very nice and elegant positive results for two alternatives. Then we will also talk about strategic manipulation. That is something that I briefly mentioned in the first lecture. And then we move on to more than two alternatives. And there we will see that the results are not as nice as we would like them to be. So we will talk about the so-called Condorcet paradox. And then at the end of the lecture, if there's enough time, I don't know yet, um, I probably have enough time to show you um, the arrow impossibility theorem without a proof. So I'm probably just going to state it at the end of today's lecture. So that's the outline for today. Okay. Um, just change this here. Okay. Um, so for the beginning, we will, we will introduce the formal framework for social choice. And this works as follows. So the main type of function that we are talking about is a so-called social choice function, which is a function that maps a feasible set to a subset of the alternatives, just like a choice function. But on top of that, we have an additional parameter. And, and this or variable, so this variable denoted by R up there is from the set D of U. So D of U somehow, or elements of D of U somehow represent the preferences of the voters. And based on these preferences, we are going to make a choice. Um, how D of U is defined, at least for the uh, next couple of lectures, I'm going to show you in a minute. But for now, let's just realize that F is a function um, that takes as input some variable R and a feasible set, and then it chooses some subset of the alternative. So it's basically just that we are extending the framework of choice theory by having an additional input, and this input will be the preferences of the different agents. Um, and okay, as it is stated on the slide, so sometimes, so this function has two different parameters, so R and the feasible set A, and sometimes one of these parameters will be fixed. So sometimes the preferences of the voters will be fixed, or sometimes we are always talking about the same feasible set from which we are making a choice. When one of this is the case, we will just omit the second variable for, of the function, just for simplicity, because it just can be annoying to always write R, 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 or A, A, A. Okay, so. But of course, the important missing piece for now is um, what are these preferences of the voters? How do we represent the preferences of the voters? And the reason why I'm putting all of this in this set uh, calligraphic D of U is because we are going to change this over the course of the semester. For the beginning, it will be a rather simple definition, and later on, we will make slight changes to that. So for now, um, the set D of U will be R of U to the N. Okay, and R of U is the set of all transitive and complete relations over U. So that means, so R of U are the preferences of a single agent or a single voter. And these preferences of single agents are assumed to be complete and transitive. So recall that in the last lecture, so we talked about different kinds of rational, rationality. So preference relation can be transitive or only quasi-transitive or acyclic or maybe none of these. So here we are making the strongest rationality assumption. So the preference relation of a voter is a complete and transitive relation. So that means that preferences are ordinal. So we are only making ordinal comparisons between alternatives. So we don't introduce something like intensity of preferences where we assign, for instance, utility numbers. It's just an ordinal relation. And um, since it's complete and transitive, these preferences can be nicely represented as a weak ranking of the alternatives. Okay, so it does allow for ties, so preferences don't have to be strict. So we can, for instance, say something like, uh, we like alternatives A and C the best, and then it's alternative B, and then it's alternative D, and so on. So something like this would be a complete and transitive preference relation. In many cases, so this is not stated on the slide, we will look at the special case where preferences are strict, and these will be called strict preference relations, or anti-symmetric preference relations, or sometimes we also call them linear preference relations. But for now, preferences are weak, which means it also, they also allow for ties. And then the second ingredient is the set of voters. Um, so for the first couple of lectures, the set of voters will be just um, a set of numbers from one to little n. So we have n different voters. And therefore, this thing here is just, so this is a notation for the set of functions from n to r of u. So that means we are mapping each voter 
to a preference relation. Okay, and, and this is what we want to have as an input for a social choice function. So each voter has one preference relation, um, and this is precisely what we are representing in this variable R, which is part of the input of a social choice function. Okay, and these elements of D of U um, are called preference profiles. And as I just said, so strictly speaking, mathematically, these elements of U are functions that map a voter to a preference relation. Um, but of course, it will be quite, or it's not of course, but it, it will be more convenient for us to write these so-called preference profiles as vectors. Because basically what we have is a preference relation for each of the voters. For now, the voters are just numbered from 1 to n. And therefore, we are going to write a preference profile, um, which is the second part of or the first part of the input of a social choice function. We will write it as a vector where we have one preference relation for each of the voters. Okay, so first input is so called preference profile, one preference relation for each voter. Second part is a feasible set, and then the function maps to a set of good alternatives. Or if you can think of these as the winners of the voting rule, if the social choice function that we are looking at uh, can be considered a voting rule. Um, so in order to save space, so for those of you who are really mathematically inclined and like uh, formalisms, so whenever I use the symbol R, I always mean a preference profile. R prime will also always be a preference profile. A will always be a feasible set, and B will also always be a feasible set. So I will not, whenever I have a definition, always route down, write, uh, let R and R prime be two preference profiles or something. I will just always assume R, R prime, R prime prime. They're always preference profiles, just for simplicity, because otherwise definitions can be really long and annoying. Um, any questions so far regarding this general model? Because that is something that we are going to use for basically the rest of the course. Okay, if not, uh, let me explain you what kind of changes we are also making on later in the course, because you, made, you, you, you may wonder why, maybe it's, it seems a bit over formalistic, because, well, the set D of U for now is just R of U to the end, so these are the, the preference profiles that we are looking at. Um, but the idea of this is that we are later going to change this, and then this D of U will be something different. So D of U, by the way, it's the letter D because that stands for domain. Stands for domain. It's the input domain of a social choice function. Um, so later we are going to redefine D of U, for instance, to also allow for um, strict preference relations. Okay, so now preference relations can be weak, so you can have ties in your preferences. But for some kinds of results, we obtain much, much nicer and more elegant results if preferences are strict. And then we are going to redefine D of, D of U as the set of preference profiles where all the voters have strict preferences. Um, and one other change that we are also making much later in this course is that we are also ch uh, changing the set of voters. So as we have it right now, the set n is the set of voters and it will remain fixed. So we always have n voters numbered from one to little n. But later on, we will have uh, axioms that use different sets of voters. So we will have two different so-called electorates of voters, and then some axioms will make um, statements about what happens in a preference profile that is defined on one set of voters and another set of voters at the same time. So therefore, we are going to, to vary this, um, and then D of U will be defined differently. But this is just a look ahead. So for now, um, the set of voters will be fixed, and therefore, um, this extra notation that is, that is explained here, so n of r, so that is the set of voters that is used in the preference profile r. Um, for now, this will just be the set of voters n, because it will, be, it, it will be fixed all the time. But later on, we will have preference profiles, which, for instance, let's make a concrete example, we will have a preference profile that is defined for voters 1, 2, 3, and we will have another, another profile that is defined for voters 4, 5, and 6, for instance. Um, and then n of r gives us the set of voters for one specific preference profile. For now, and for instance, for the definitions today, you can just replace nr with n because it doesn't make a difference. But I'm going to state the definitions in a more general way because then later on the same definitions also make sense. So this is something that I changed in, in contrast to, to last year when I taught the course. So maybe at this point, it may, be a bit, uh, may, may seem a bit complicated, but it, it makes things easier later on. And also it make, makes things more precise. So sometimes in previous years, I was at some stages of this course saying, well, okay, this is a slight abuse of notation, and here we are actually making an extra assumption that I haven't stated formally. I think now things are 
um, are like more precise and, and clearer in the end. Okay, so one other thing that is quite important um, to, to understand at this point is that how this is related to choice theory and the properties of choice theory that we have introduced last time. So if you recall last time, the main theorem was this theorem by Zen, which established this very strong equivalence between rationalizability and consistency. And these types of conditions we are also going to use for social choice functions. And the idea is, oh, okay, so, yeah, okay, so let's just quickly introduce one extra piece of notation, um, which is um, that um, we also defined and our, uh, how a preference relation can be restricted to some subset of the alternative, so that I defined in the last lecture, I think, and we are going to do the same thing for preference profiles. So sometimes we have a subset of alternatives, maybe just two alternatives, and then we are restricting um, a preference profile to these two alternatives, and that just means we are doing it for each preference relation in the preference profile. So it's just the straightforward extension of this notation that you would expect. Okay. Um, but what I wanted to say, actually, is that if we have a social choice function, which has these two different inputs, and we fix the preference profile, if the preference profile just remains fixed, well, then the social choice function actually induces a choice function. Right? Because then the remaining input for the function is just a feasible set, and then the social choice function maps a feasible set to a feasible subset. So it's just a choice function once the preference profile is fixed. And this is also how we generalize and extend these conditions of rationalizability and consistency when we want to say that a social choice function satisfies, say, alpha or gamma, for instance. Whenever we say something like this, we mean that for each preference profile, if we fix the preference profile, the induced choice function should satisfy alpha or gamma or rationalizability or consistency, whatever condition we have in mind. So this is how we can apply these uh, conditions from the last lecture, from choice theory, to social choice functions. So we fix the preference profile, and if, if the induced choice functions for any preference profile satisfy the given condition, then we also say that a social choice function satisfies, say, alpha, gamma, or beta plus, or something. And this will be important, for instance, in the first part of the semester, where we will talk about impossibility results, because we will see that um, many of these conditions that are like essential in the context of choice theory cannot be obtained for social choice functions. Okay, so this is the basic framework here. So by the way, so in, in today's lecture, probably last lecture was, was just like this. Um, I'm going to introduce many different concepts and definitions and just a, as a reminder for you, I think I also posted it in the Moodle forum. So I have this PDF document on Moodle which I, which I uh, adapt or update b before each lecture. So there you can see all the definitions that I'm going to use in the lecture. And if, for instance, if at one point you're wondering how this model was defined or how some axiom was defined, you can just look it up in the PDF. And maybe even ideally, if, if, if you find that some of the definitions, or if, if in general the definitions that I'm giving here, um, if it, that you don't have enough time to completely understand them before I'm working with them. So you can also, before the lecture, look at this sheet of paper and try to understand the definitions. I will explain them again, of course, but I, I guess that can help in, in getting an understanding of the concepts that I'm using here. Okay, so that's the basic framework. Um, now, as I said, so I'm going to introduce several definitions, so especially in the first half of this course, um, there are many, many properties that need to be defined. And the first kinds of properties that I'm defining are so-called fairness conditions, or you could also think of them as symmetry conditions for social choice functions. So these are properties that only make sense for social choice functions. So we have some consistency properties that we, that we can directly import from choice theory, but these are properties for social choice functions. Um, the first property that I would like to introduce is called anonymity. And the idea of this property is that for many applications, we want uh, to have that a social choice function does not depend on the identities of the different voters or agents. Okay, so we want it to be symmetric with respect to the identities of the voters. So what I mean by this is, so if you go all the way back to the first lecture, because that's when you have seen some preference profiles, um, so one representation that I chose there is that we had these tables um, where we had different columns for the different voters, right? 
Um, and in this representation, sometimes on top of these columns, I just wrote the number of voters who had this preference relation. Right? And the ordering of the columns didn't matter at all. So this is what I want to formalize now. I want to have a property that says who has which preference relation doesn't matter. It's only important that there is, say, one voter who has preference relation ABC, there's one who has BCA and one CBA, for instance. That's, that's what is important. But the ordering or the, the identities of the voters should not matter. Okay, so that, that I think is a property that intuitively, hopefully all of you have, have some understanding and, and would like this property to be satisfied. But one thing that you also realize in, in today's lecture is that sometimes making these definitions formal, maybe some of you have already looked at the PDF, uh, can be a bit tedious and maybe it, it looks uh, different from what you had in mind when you were first thinking about the condition. So having said that, uh, let's look at the formal definition of, of the property of anonymity. Um, so a social choice function is anonymous. If so this is one of the conditions, for instance, where the agenda is not really important. So there, this has to hold for all agendas, but the agenda is not really modified. So let's just ignore the agenda for now. Basically, we have two different preference profiles, R and R prime. And then there's a bijection pi that maps from the set of voters that is present in R and the set of voters that is present in R prime. So this is an example where, since we have a fixed set of voters for the first couple of lectures, so you can just Right, uh, see this as a bijection or permutation from n to n, because the set of voters remains fixed all the time, so we are permuting the voters. Um, and we have this permutation, and then we use this to, to have, um, or to state how these preference profiles are related to each other. So these are the preference relations from the first preference profile, and these are the preference relations from the second profile, hence the prime here. Um, and what this here is saying is just that we are um, changing the ordering of the preference relations in the preference profile. Okay, so we are, or in other words, we are renaming the voters. So, uh, according to the permutation. So maybe we had three voters in the beginning, one, two, three, and now this permutation pi tells us that voter one is now voter two, and voter three is now voter one, and so on. So we can have any any type of permutation, and these preference profiles are related according to this permutation. Okay, and, and this of course has to hold for all i. And then the consequence, okay, so here we have the quantifiers at the end. Um, the consequence of this condition is this here. So the outcome or the output of the social choice function should be exactly the same if we just change the ordering of the voters, right? So this is what we want to have with anonymity. So if we change the identities of the voters, so if there's a bijection or permutation, since we have the same set of voters for now, um, then the outcome of the social choice function should be exactly the same. So it's like changing the columns in the preference profile. Okay, so, so that's how formally anonymity is defined. And it just means that the voting rule or the social choice function treats all the voters equally, exactly in the same way. So, this is, so the conditions that I have on this slide are very basic assumptions um, that almost all the functions that we are looking at in this course um, should satisfy. So these are not really very demanding conditions, they're like minimal conditions that we would like to impose on SCFs. Okay. Or, yeah, one other way to see it is that renaming the voters does not affect the outcome. Um, so can anybody think of a social choice function say, on two alternatives, just for simplicity, which is not anonymous. Yes? Okay. So the suggestion... Yeah, the suggestion was to have a dictator, so which is something we haven't formally introduced yet. Maybe you have heard it somewhere else, but it's... So it's, it's what you would expect. So a dictatorial social choice function is... We are going to introduce it maybe in today's lecture. is a social choice function where, um, say, you have only two different alternatives, and whatever the top choice of, this, of one specific voter I is, say the, the dictator is voter I, um, then this alternative will be chosen, no matter what the preferences of all the other voters are. Okay, so um, let's say, so it's, it's like, we are the set of voters, I'm the dictator, whenever I think A is best, um, then A is chosen, whenever I think B is best, then B is chosen, and your preferences don't matter at all. And the question is, is whether this is an example of a function that violates anonymity. And it is, it is a very good example. It's like the most drastic violation of anonymity you can think of, right? And formally, you can see it by, if we permute um, the identities of the voters, if somehow now you are the dictator rather than me, 
um, well, then the outcome shouldn't change, um, okay, but it, uh, but it does change because I am the dictator by definition, and if we change our preferences, um, whatever you had as a first choice will now be my first choice, and this alternative will be selected. Okay, so therefore, anonymity is clearly violated by any dictatorial function. Um, okay, so that's anonymity. And the next condition, so before I show you the formal definition, let's try to give you some intuitive insight, is so we would like to have something similar based on the set of alternatives. Okay, so this is a fairness condition for voters. So if we permute the voters, the outcome shouldn't change. And it would be nice to have a similar symmetry condition for uh, alternatives. And this condition is called neutrality. It's not completely dual um, because the consequence is slightly different. So Again, we want to have uh, two different preference profiles, um, and we have two different feasible sets now. And then we have a permutation, uh, we have a uh, bijection, which tells us that the alternatives are renamed, just like in the example of anonymity. So rather than renaming voters, so voter one is now voter two, we are saying that alternative A is now alternative B, and so on. So we are just renaming the alternatives. But what is different now is that the consequence shouldn't be that the outcome should be exactly the same. Right, so that, that would be really weird. So let's say um, we apply a social choice function, alternative A is the best alternative, um, and now we are renaming the alternatives in the preference profile, so A now is, is now B and B is now A, then of course the outcome should change accordingly. Right? So that is what we want to have. And this is why I say neutrality is not exactly dual to anonymity, but it has a very similar flavor. So we are renaming the alternatives, but the consequence is, is that the names of the alternatives in the choice set should be renamed accordingly, of course. Okay, and this is how this definition looks like. Again, let's look at the formalism here. Okay, so now we have uh, two feasible sets, A and B, two preference profiles, and now we have this bijection pi from one feasible set to another feasible set. And um, we say that for all voters i, voter i weakly prefers x to y if and only if um, in this other preference profile, this voter prefers pi of x to pi of y. Okay, so we are just applying this permutation to the set of alternatives. And this has to hold for all voters and for all pairs of alternatives x and y. And then, as I said earlier, the consequence is not that the outcome should be the same as for anonymity, but that the alternatives in the choice set should be renamed accordingly. So again, for like mathematical purists, so I'm doing something here, maybe which is a slight abuse of notation. So I am, the permutation pi is defined from alternatives to alternatives. So I'm renaming one alternative to another alternative. Here I am applying pi to a set of alternatives, okay? Because what f returns is a set of alternatives. But here it's just a straightforward or canonical extension of pi to sets, which just means that each of the alternatives is renamed according to the permutation pi. Okay, so we are renaming all the alternatives here according to this um, bijection here. Um, right, and also note that so since this is a bijection, so A and B has to ha have to have the same number of alternatives. So there, there are many things that we can do. So A and B could also be the same sets. So it could be that we have th three alternatives, A, B, C, and then the alternatives within this feasible set are just renamed. It's like in a cyclic fashion, for instance, A becomes B, B becomes C, and C becomes A. But we could also have something where A and B are disjoint sets, where we have A, B, C, and D, E, F, and now A becomes D, and B becomes E, and so on. So that would also be possible. So all of this is allowed uh, by neutrality. Okay. Um, so, as in the case of anonymity, any idea of an example of a social choice function, again, let's restrict attention to two alternatives, that is not neutral. Okay, so you already answered the other question. That should be doable for anybody, I guess. So, social choice function on two alternatives, which is not neutral. So it should be something where we are not treating the alternatives symmetrically. There are many, many possibilities. There's not just a single correct answer. You smile like it's too easy for you, is it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
no ideas? Social choice function which is not neutral? Yes? Uh, okay. Um, Yes. Well, actually, this is a this is a good example. So it, it's I, I was pausing for a moment because it's not for two al for, for two alternatives. It's just a, a very simple special case, and then it actually is neutral if you have only two alternatives. But for more than two alternatives, um, it's a very good example of a social choice function indeed, which is not neutral, because if you think back, so this function was introduced in the first lecture. So we had these like sequential comparisons A versus B, and then the winner versus C, winner versus D, and it's it's. We haven't shown it here, but it's, it's fairly obvious that by changing the ordering of the alternatives, you can actually affect the outcome. Um, and that me also means that if you are renaming the alternatives, the outcome can also be affected. Um, so in this sense, it's a good example because all of these five voting rules that I introduced in the first lecture, so they all satisfy anonymity and neutrality unless we break ties in a weird way, right? So we could also do plurality where if there's a tie between A and B, we will always pick A, for, for instance, something like this. But if we, if we always return a set, if there's a tie, so then all of these rules satisfy anonymity and neutrality, um, but sequential majority comparisons doesn't satisfy neutrality. So that's the only exception. Um, but maybe something simpler if you have only two alternatives. So we can choose between two alternatives so I give you an example of a rule that satisfies anonymity and neutrality, which would be majority rule, right? So that means if you have two alternatives, if there's a majority in favor of A, we pick A. If there's a majority in favor of B, we pick B. And if, if there's a tie, well, then we pick A and B. So it's, it's indifference in that case. So that clearly it satisfies anonymity and neutrality. So how can we break neutrality but still retain anonymity? Yes? Uh, to, do, do, to do what? To disregard? Okay, oh, okay, yeah, excellent. So that's, that's a great answer. So we can disregard all the votes and always pick one alternative independently of the preferences of the voters. So the example would be, for instance, the constant function, which always returns A. So we say the alternatives are A and B. If you always return <coughs> A, well, the function clearly is not neutral, right? Um, but um, it is a valid social choice function. So we can always return A. So nobody said that we have to take into account the preferences of the voters. So th that's like, like maybe like uh, dictatorship is perhaps the most drastic example of an anonymity violation. So this is perhaps the most drastic example of a neutrality violation. So always retain the same alternative no matter what. Um, you can think of less drastic examples where, for instance, I, I mentioned majority rule. You can have something where you pick A if two thirds are in favor of A and otherwise you pick B. Okay, so that is, that is an anonymous function because, well, anonymity is satisfied because essentially you only count voters, so how many voters prefer one alternative over the other, um, but um, it's not neutral because well, it's not symmetric with respect to the alternatives. You are, you are treating uh, B better than you are treating A in this example. That would be another example. Okay. Okay, so this is... Uh, yeah, similar to what we had for anonymity. Um, so, so one thing is, is that maybe I will also get back later to this when we have when we characterize a voting rule for two alternatives. So clearly, we would want any social choice function to satisfy anonymity and neutrality. Um, but there are some examples in the real world where this is not the case. So because the midterm elections are coming up in the U.S., um, so you know probably know that for for U.S. elections, so they have been featured quite prominently in in the news in recent years. So they have this electoral college system um, and therefore anonymity is violated, right? It depends on whether you are a voter in California or in one of these swing states like Ohio, Florida or uh, Pennsylvania, for instance. So in, in other words, you can, and, and you could even for the outcome of, of previous elections, you could find, so for instance, when Clint, Clinton was running against Trump and Trump won the election, 
um, you could really distribute the voters. So if you just put some of the voters from California who were in favor of, of uh, Clinton, for instance, to say Florida and Ohio to make these change, uh, states actually switch, you could have changed the election outcome. So you can find a permutation of the voters which changes the outcome. So just as a real-world example, the anonymity is, is violated. Okay, but uh, one other thing that is important uh, now for the condition of neutrality is um, that this condition also includes something that maybe you have not realized at first, and this is uh, basically what we will later call independence of infeasible alternatives. So it's one of the conditions that is used in Eros impossibility theorem, um, because the way I defined neutrality here, it also doesn't matter what the preferences of the voters are about alternatives that are not in the feasible set. Why is that the case? So if you look at the definition of neutrality, and you define the permutation pi or bijection pi uh, as a function, as the identity function, which just maps every alternative to itself, A and B are the same set of alternatives, then this condition still has a consequence because we are saying that for two different preference profiles for which the preferences within the feasible set are the same, the outcome of the function should also be the same. But in particular, the preferences of the voters uh, between alternatives that are not in the feasible set could change. So we can have two preference profiles, R and R prime, where the preferences that are outside of the feasible set A, so A and B are identical in this case, um, are different, and then the condition still implies that the outcome should be the same. Okay, so what neutrality as defined here implies is that whenever we are making a choice from a feasible set, this should be independent of the preferences of the voters of, over alternatives that are outside of the feasible set. Okay, but it seems like a reasonable condition because otherwise feasible sets wouldn't really be important um, because if, if preferences over alternatives that are not even in the feasible set can be taken into account, it seems somewhat unnatural. But this is just something that I would like to realize, uh, or you to realize, um, because we will later then weaken this neutrality condition to this arrow IIA condition. Okay, but the way this works is just how I specified here, by letting pi be the identity function and letting A and B be identical. Okay. Now there's a couple of more definitions, um, but this one is something that we can go over quite quickly, I think, because that is also something we had in the first lecture, only rather informally, but um, e even then I think it was quite obvious what this condition means. So there are a couple of concepts related to the notion of Pareto optimality, and all of them need to be formally defined at some point. That's what I'm doing here. So just to remind you, so X Pareto dominates Y if everybody strictly prefers X to Y. Okay, so if all the voters strictly prefer X to Y, then X Pareto dominates Y. So it's, it defines a relation, the Pareto dominance relation. And we say that Y is Pareto dominated if there is some X that Pareto dominates Y. Okay, so this is just terminology that I'm introducing. I will sometimes say that an alternative is Pareto dominated, but maybe I won't even mention which alternative Pareto dominates it. And then we have this notion of Pareto optimality, which just means that an alternative Y is Pareto optimal if it is not Pareto dominated by any alternative X. Okay, and ideally, of course, we would want to have social choice functions that are Pareto optimal, which means functions that do not return Pareto dominated alternatives. So in the first lecture, we had an example where, I think it was also sequential majority comparisons, violates um, Pareto optimality, which means <coughs> that an alternative is returned, even though there's another alternative that everybody prefers. Okay, so it's like the weakest uncontroversial notion of social optimality, because social choice is about trade-offs usually, so um, the preferences of the voters are usually in conflict with each other, but this is a rare example where preferences are all aligned, so everybody agrees that X is better than Y, then clearly Y should not be chosen. So there's not even a compromise necessary here. Or you can also, so sometimes Pareto optimality is also phrased slightly differently, where you say an outcome is Pareto optimal if it's impossible to make somebody better off without making somebody else worse off. Okay, that's, that's also quite intuitive. Um, for those of you who have taken AGT, so, so this notion is slightly different from the one we had in AGT, so the notion of Pareto dominance is a bit stronger, and that leads to a weaker notion of Pareto optimality because, because of the negation, but it's only for those who have taken AGT. Okay, so we also will talk about 
a social choice function, which is called Pareto rule. So it's a social choice function that is uh, based on this Pareto notion, and it just returns all Pareto optimal alternatives. Okay, it's ra rather indecisive. So in many cases, it will return all alternatives. Um, and this function clearly is anonymous and neutral, obviously. So it's a, a simple example of a function that is anonymous and neutral. And finally, um, so we say, I think that I mentioned actually already, so we say that a social choice function is Pareto optimal if for all feasible sets and all preference profiles the function only returns Pareto optimal alternatives. <coughs> um, yeah, so I think this is basically what you would expect. And uh, those are all concepts related to Pareto optimality. So I guess this is pretty straightforward. Okay. Now, next, uh, another definition. Uh, but once we have this definition, we're actually going to work with some of these definitions. And this is the definition of resoluteness. And in contrast to the other definitions, which have like a normative flavor, so especially fairness conditions like anonymity and neutrality are of the kind, so um, because of like normative reasons, we would want a social choice function to satisfy anonymity and neutrality at all costs. So this is more like a practical requirement. And the condition just says that the output of a social choice function should always be a singleton. For every preference profile and every feasible set, we should only return a single alternative. Okay? And, and maybe this is something that you had in mind right from the beginning when we talked about voting rules and social choice functions, and we, we actually started to talk about multi-valued functions right from the beginning, um, and maybe to some of you this was a bit confusing because for most applications in the end you want to have one single winner, right? So what does it mean if, uh, if, there, if alternatives or candidates in a political election, candidates A, B, C are the winners? We, we want to have a single winner in the end, and therefore resoluteness seems like a, like a very um, important practical requirement for many applications. Nevertheless, so on this slide, I will try to convince you why resoluteness is perhaps not such a good idea after all, um, because it is in conflict with these fairness conditions that we introduced earlier. So that doesn't mean that I'm, that I'm advocating that uh, we, we have to have sets of winners in the end. The problem is only that these social choice functions, if they are resolute, so they have to pick a single alternative based on the preferences of the voters only. Right, so it doesn't. So the social choice functions we define don't allow, for instance, to pick one of these alternatives from the set of tight winners by randomization, for instance. So that is something that we will also explore later in this course. But for now, if a social choice function picks a single alternative, it has to do so based on the preferences of the voters only. So no randomization or, or any other type of um, of extra information here. Um, so the first thing to realize is that. Um, Anonymous and neutral social choice functions cannot be resolute in general. So I said that resoluteness is in conflict with these fairness conditions. And this is, for example, the case if we have two alternatives and two voters. So it can be relatively easily shown that no function can satisfy anonymity, neutrality, and resoluteness. So you can think of this as a very simple impossibility theorem. Um, maybe some of you already have the idea in mind why this has to be the case. Right, so if we have two voters, two alternatives, we can have strict preferences, for instance, one voter prefers A to B, the other one prefers B to A. We have to return a single alternative. The function has to be completely fair and symmetric, so voters, uh, votes count the same, the alternatives are treated in the same way, so how can we pick a single alternative? Whenever we pick a single alternative, somehow either anonymity or neutrality, or maybe both of them are violated. So that's the intuition, um, that because of symmetry, we cannot just pick a single alternative. But since we have these formal definitions now, and just to give you some idea of how to formally, formally work with them, I am going to prove this uh, maybe a bit more formally um, than uh, what you usually would have done. But let's just try to formally show that if you have two voters, two alternatives, um, that no function that is resolute can satisfy anonymity and neutrality at the same time. Okay, so we start with the preference profile R. So this preference profile has two voters. And as I said, so one voter prefers A to B and the other one prefers B to A. Okay, so let's try to write a bit more cleanly. Um, by the way, so one thing, 
So I think sometimes in the first lecture, these numbers up here were numbers of voters, so which would mean that these are two voters and this one voter. This is not the case here. So these are the identities of the voters, which are important for the proof because we are using anonymity. So that's why I draw circles um, uh, around them. So there are only two voters, voter one, voter two. Okay, now for this preference profile, any resolute function has to return some alternative. We don't know which one, A or B. So let's call this alternative X. Okay, since it's resolute, it's just a single alternative. Now, um, we have, uh, on top of resoluteness, we have these two extra conditions, anonymity and neutrality. So let's first apply anonymity. So the main reason for this, uh, for this little proof here is to show you how to define these permutations that uh, are part of the definitions of anonymity and neutrality. Okay, so if you're using anonymity now, Anonymity is based on a permutation or bijection pi of the set of voters. Um, if there are only two voters, well, there's only one interesting permutation, so you can just permute voter one and two. Or more formally, pi is um, that one becomes two and two becomes one. Okay, so I hope this is, you can read this. Um, okay, so then we have a new preference profile. Again, voter 1 and voter 2, but now voter 1 prefers B to A and voter 2 prefers A to B. Let's call this preference profile R prime. And then the social choice function. So the only thing we know about this function F here is that it satisfies anonymity, neutrality, and resoluteness. So we don't know which function it is. But if it satisfies anonymity, what can we say about the outcome now? Um, yes, it has to be the same. So it still has to be singleton X. Okay, um, so far so good. Now we haven't used neutrality yet, and that's the missing piece of the proof now. So next thing that we are doing is, is we are now using neutrality. And neutrality uses a permutation or a bijection um, of the alternatives. If we only have two different alternatives available, there's only one choice, so A becomes B and B becomes A. So that means the resulting preference profile looks like this. Okay, so I just took this profile here and now I'm remaining, uh, I'm renaming, <laughs> renaming alternatives A and B. Okay, and this is preference profile R prime prime. Okay, and now what does neutrality say? Um, what is the consequence of neutrality when I apply it now? Yes? Exactly, perfect. Um, so neutrality only says that the outcome should be different, right? So because we, we, we now have to apply this permutation pi, and when it was A, it now has to be B, when it was B, it now has to be A, but in any case, the outcome should be different from X should still be a singleton, but it should not be x. Okay, but then we already see the contradiction here, right? Because the preference profile R and the preference profile R prime prime are the same preference profiles. There's no difference. And here we say x has to be returned, and here we say x should not be returned. So therefore, maybe let's use red here. So this gives a contradiction, and that already completes the proof. Okay, so it's, it's as I said, so it's not really difficult, but maybe for those of you who have uh, trouble understanding formalism, so it's, it's nice to see how these permutations um, are defined for these steps in the proof. Okay, and, and that shows that for two alternatives, two voters, um, there is no social choice function which satisfies the given properties. So th that can already be seen as a reason why um, we should perhaps move away from resoluteness, right? Because if we insist on resoluteness and anonymity and neutrality, so then for the simple case of two voters and two alternatives, no function exists. Okay, and the alternative therefore, of course, is to um, allow for sets of winners, um, which we, for instance, do in the majority rule case, which I mentioned earlier. So if a majority is in favor of A, we pick A. Um, if a majority is in favor of B, we pick B. And if there's exactly a tie, then we return two alternatives, and then we leave how ties are, are broken, we leave open to some, some other type of function or maybe random device or anything, but we can still satisfy anonymity and neutrality. Okay, so 
one thing that you can now look uh, more deeply at is under which circumstances there do exist anonymous, neutral, and resolute social choice functions. And this is something that Moulin has done. So Heavy Moulin is an important social choice theorist. Um, this is a bit of a mathematical exercise. So you can think of the different combinations of M and N under which resoluteness and the symmetry conditions can be satisfied at the same time. So there are two variants of this theorem. So this one is a bit nicer because it also uses Pareto optimality on top of these conditions. So we have an extra condition because Pareto optimality, as I said, is really a very mild condition and basically any function that we study should satisfy Pareto optimality. So if you want these four conditions to be satisfied, anonymity, neutrality, Pareto optimality and resoluteness, and we assume that preferences are strict now, so this is one of these cases where we are restricting our attention to strict preferences, um, then such a function exists if and only if the number of voters um, cannot be divided by any Q where Q is between 2 and M. Or in other words, uh, N has no prime factor less or equal than M. Okay, so maybe you can already imagine that there could be some connection like this, or some like a, basically like a number theoretic connection for which combinations of N and M resolute social choice functions exist, but this is a um, quite nice characterization result. And it's so nice that it's on the upcoming exercise sheet, so I'm not going to prove it here, but it's a I'm pretty sure, yeah, it is a T exercise, so it's a tutorial exercise, so we, we don't ask you to prove it on your own, um, but it also has a nice and, nice and elegant proof. Um, rather, that what I would like to do in, uh, on this slide here is to give you some more intuition into this kind of result. Um, so let's look at some examples. So for instance, um, if we have that M is two, so that means we have two alternatives, and the number of voters is odd. Okay, so then I'm claiming there is a social choice function that satisfies all these conditions, anonymity, neutrality, resoluteness, and Pareto optimality. So, and here it says um, which one and why. So first, why, why does there exist such a function? Well, we can, first, we can just look at the theorem here, and we've realized that, um, well, if the number of voters is odd, um, then the only option for such a Q in the theorem here is just two, well, and no odd number can be, is divisible by two. So, so therefore, such a function has to exist. Okay, so it's, it's consistent with, with what the theorem says. So no odd number is even, um, therefore, such a function has to exist. So which function could that be? So that should be pretty clear by now because I did mention this function a couple of times. Function, yes? Yes, majority rule, right? So it's, so it's, I mentioned earlier that it's anonymous and it's neutral. It's also pretty obviously Pareto optimal. So if everybody prefers A to B, that's a, a very large majority. So it's unanimity. The only missing part is resoluteness. So in general, majority rule is not resolute. But here we assume that there's an odd number of voters and the voters have strict preferences. Okay, so that's an assumption in the theorem. And if there's an odd number of voters and strict preferences, there can be no ties. Okay, so therefore majority rule is a resolute function. Okay, so that would be a positive example. Um, now, to have a ne negative example, so if we have at least two alternatives and the number of voters is even, well then according to the theorem there should be no such function. Right? Um, just because if you check this condition in the theorem, well, the number of voters is even, the number of alternatives is, is at least two, so that means we can just, as Q, we can just take this number two, and two, of course, divides any even number, so therefore there should be no such function. Um, so that follows from the theorem, but we can easily convince ourselves, maybe let's do this directly on the slide, why this is the case, um, because Basically, the idea is exactly the same as the one that we had on this previous proof that I showed you for two alternatives and two voters. So let's first look at the special case of two voters. Okay, so we had this preference profile where we had AB and BA. Um, so those were the preferences of two voters. Now I'm claiming that the same kind of, so for two alternatives and two voters, so there is no resolute function that satisfies anonymity and neutrality. Uh, we don't even need Pareto optimality here. Now I'm claiming the same thing is true for also for more than two alternatives. So what could we do with the additional alternatives to get the same statement here? So let's say we have an additional alternative C and want to use the same kind of argument here as we did in the previous proof that I showed you. Yes? Yes? 
Right? But we, we now have this extra condition of Pareto optimality at our hands, right? So we can use Pareto optimality. So maybe we can make this a bit simpler by completely ruling out that C may be returned. Okay. So how, how would we do that in this preference profile here? Um, if you want to make sure that C cannot be returned. Yes? Exactly. So we just add it at the bottom here. Okay, then C cannot be returned, and then for these three alternatives and two voters, we can use exactly the same proof as before. So it's like formally we are using a permutation on the voters and then on the alternatives, but in the first step, we, we know that this alternative X that is returned can only be A or B, but it can never be C. And, and the same argument, of course, works if we add D, E, and so on. It works for, for any number of alternatives. Um, and now this is supposed to hold even if, if uh, for, for more general or larger, even numbers of voters, so this is only for two voters, but we can just have pairs of voters like these, right? So we can just have, um, I don't know, should I do that? Yeah, so okay, now I'm using the different notation here, so we can have two voters of the first type and two voters of the second kind, and then we have this permutation which just exchanges pairs of voters and the same type of argument works. So this is really just a very ugly and uh, sketchy argument which shows why this particular theorem, for instance, holds for this case here, without looking at the proof that, that you are seeing in the tutorial exercise. So this is just to getting more insight into this theorem. Okay. Um, now there was one other thing. Okay, so this is really tricky. Um, it, it's, it doesn't even follow from the theorem, uh, but I nevertheless would like to mention it briefly. Um, so if you look at this third statement here, so here we are using anonymity, neutrality, resoluteness, but not Pareto optimality. So that's why the theorem doesn't apply. So the theorem only holds for Pareto optimal social choice functions. We have dropped Pareto optimality now. And now I'm claiming that there is a function that satisfies these three conditions if M is three and the number of voters is two. Okay, so note that if you check the condition of the theorem that um, it's, uh, there's no such function. So if you also, so if we, also would impose Pareto optimality, no such function, function would exist. Which means that the function that I have in mind now has to violate Pareto optimality. And like, if we had lots of time, I would ask you for potential candidates for such a function, but it's really tricky, so I'm going to reveal it to you. So we have only two voters and three alternatives. So I guess it's a nice example to see what kind of crazy functions you can define. Um, and the function works as follows. So if the two voters agree on the top choice, so again, we have strict preferences, so then this alternative is selected. If the two voters disagree in the top choice, one likes A and the other one likes B, then we pick C. <laughs> okay? And that works for any, for any. so if, if the top choices are B and C, then we pick A. If the top choices are A and C, then we pick B. But the nice thing about this type of construction is, is that it satisfies anonymity and neutrality. So we are not treating any alternative unfairly. All the voters count exactly, uh, all, of, all the votes count exactly in the same way. So it satisfies anonymity and neutrality. It's also resolute, but according to the theorem, it has to violate Pareto optimality. Okay, but that, if you think about it, is pretty straightforward, right? So if if the top choices are A and B, and you pick alternative C. In any case, you would also pick alternative C if it is bottom ranked by both of these voters. So that means it's Pareto dominated, but still it's selected. Okay, so this function only satisfies three of these four conditions. All right. Um, okay, so all of this, the, the main point of all of this is just to, to justify why we are looking at set valued functions. So we want anonymity and neutrality to, to be satisfied, and then later on in this course, we will also talk about how ties can be broken, but for now, we want to allow for ties in the outcome because we want these fairness conditions to be satisfied at all costs. And also, we don't want to do social choice for certain, which only works for certain combinations of M and N, right? So we don't want to do social choice, um, which doesn't work if, then, if an extra voter arrives, for instance, everything breaks down. That's, that we don't want to have. Okay, so let's, uh, as we have done for today's lecture anyway, so let's restrict attention to pairs now and let's look at different functions um, that only work for um, uh, two element agendas. So let's, we can even assume that the universe only contains two different alternatives, A and B. 
So for this, it's convenient to have, again, two pieces of extra notation. So capital NAB denotes the set of voters who prefer, weekly prefer, A to B. And uh, small NAB denotes the number of voters who prefer A to B. Okay, so this is just something that makes things easier. Now, even if we, if we require anonymity and neutrality as these like, essential fairness conditions that any function should satisfy, there are still many choices. So there's uh, an infinite number of possible social choice functions on two alternatives. So anonymity and neutrality alone doesn't do the job of narrowing down everything to ideally just a single function. So here are some examples. So we have majority rule, which I have mentioned many times already. So this is one way of defining it. If the number of voters who prefer A to B is greater than the number of voters who prefer B to A, then we pick A. If it's the other way around, then we pick B. And in all remaining cases, we pick both A and B. Okay, so that now, that now also allows for weak preferences. So, so everything is, is well defined for any preference profile on two alternatives. Another example would be Pareto rule. Um, so you have seen in a definition, a more general definition on a previous sheet, um, they, they coincide for the case of two alternatives. So I'm just giving you this definition here because this notation with uh, this NAB also allows for like a, a nice, concise way of writing down the Pareto rule. So alternative A is selected if the number of voters who prefer B to A is zero. And alternative B is selected uniquely if the number of voters who prefer A to B is zero. And in all other cases, we return both A and B. So the Pareto rule, as I mentioned earlier, is very indecisive. <laughs> so it, it only selects a unique alternative if all the voters agree, and otherwise it, it will just return both alternatives. And if there are more than two alternatives, all the alternatives. Okay, so those two are not really new. Here's a new one, um, which I call the silly rule, um, which is defined as follows. So we uniquely return alternative A if the number of voters who prefer A to B is odd and the number of voters who prefer B to A is even. If it's the other way around, we return alternative B. And in all remaining cases, we return both alternatives A and B. Okay, so why am I giving this example? So the name already gives away that it's a not a particularly good uh, social choice function, but it does satisfy anonymity and neutrality. Okay, and how can you see that it satisfies those conditions um, without like, doing a lengthy formal proof? But if you look at these definitions here, so all of these, in all of these functions, the definition only depends on NAB, NAB and NBA, so which is just the number of voters who prefer one alternative to the other. So that means it's anonymous. So we, we cannot make any distinctions of the voters if we just count the number of voters who prefer one alternative to the other. And uh, all of these functions are neutral. Um, because you, get, you, go, you get, go from one case to the other when you just replace A with B and B with A, right? So this case here is completely symmetric to the second one, only A and B have been replaced. So it's not a formal proof, but it, here you can clearly see that this function is anonymous and neutral. Um, and uh, in some cases, it's even Pareto optimal. So if the number of voters is odd, this is a Pareto optimal function. If the number of voters is even, it doesn't even satisfy Pareto optimality um, because then at the ends of, of, of the spectrum, you, you make the wrong choices. So we will get back to the silly rule later on, but for now it's just meant to, to give you an example that shows that anonymity and neutrality um, are not sufficient to uh, identify a single voting rule, which is what we want to have for the two alternative case. So let's... Or should I do one more? Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe let's stop at this point and do the break now, um, because then after the break, I'm going to impose an extra condition, um, and this extra condition will uh, cancel or will, will rule out rules such as the silly rule, and then we will get a complete characterization of majority rule. So that is the, the, the nice result that I promised for two alternatives. So we will, um, we will rule out the Pareto rule, we will rule out the silly rule, and any other silly rule that you have in mind, and then there will be a unique function that satisfies anonymity, neutrality, and this extra condition that I'm going to define. Okay, so let's reconvene at uh, 5.30. Okay, thanks for coming back. Let's continue now. Um, so we had these examples of, of different rules that all satisfy anonymity and neutrality, but we want to narrow down the choice of a suitable 
social choice function for two alternatives to ideally a single social choice function. And therefore what is missing here, so if you look at these examples here, um, in particular the silly rule, what is missing here is some kind of property which says that if you, have, if you get more support for a certain alternative, then the, uh, then the outcome of the choice function um, should also reflect that. So in some sense, so if alternative A is returned as the winner and then more voters, we only have two different alternatives, switch the top choice from B to A, um, well then A should still be a winner, right? And this is the condition of monotonicity, um, which we had uh, in the first lecture, but only with an informal definition. So today we are formalizing this notion of monotonicity and we will also look at the strengthening of monotonicity, which is called positive responsiveness. Oh, we are not yet, um, because um, before we get there, okay, so we talk a little bit about strategic manipulation, and um, the reason why I'm doing this now is because, well, monotonicity and strategic manipulation, as we will see, are quite strongly related to each other. Okay, so it's like a little excursion to strategic manipulation. As mentioned in the first lecture, so um, assuming that the true preferences of all the voters are known, which we are doing all the time for now is, is not realistic, right? Because we don't know what the actual preferences of the voters are, we only know what they tell us. And this is something we already discussed in the first lecture, so we have to trust that what the voters tell us are the real preferences. Otherwise, we are computing the outcome for an artificial preference profile, which are not the voters' true preferences. And it turns out that voters are in many cases better off by lying about their preferences. Um, and this is usually called strategic manipulation, and of course, it, it is a big deal. And um, you may wonder what should be wrong with strategic manipulation and some, even some academics think that maybe strategic manipulation is not that bad after all because it's not only that a single voter is manipulating. So it's, you, you can have an artificial view of the preference profile and say so if all the preferences of the other voters are like this um, then maybe I am better off by changing my preference relation from this to that relation but all the other voters are doing the same thing. Right? It's like a game. So this is really where social choice theory is connected to game theory. So it's a strategic situation where everybody can manipulate at the same time um, and then you can Think about like game theoretic solution concepts, which are not part of this course, but maybe some of you have heard about Nash equilibrium, which is like a stable state. You maybe you make the assumption that in the end this will all converge. So there's all kinds of manipulation, but then there will be some stable state where nobody is better off um, by changing um, her input to this uh, social choice function. Um, and then maybe manipulation is not that bad after all, because well, if everybody's lying, then there might be some, some stable state in the end, and then we are computing the outcome for that, um, and that is maybe not that bad. Um, this reasoning doesn't really work that well, and I'll give you an example why this is the case. Um, but before we get there, let's look at other reasons why manipulation um, can be considered undesirable, and why we would want to rule out manipulation, and therefore consider so-called uh, strategy-proof social choice functions, which are functions that cannot be manipulated. Um, so, well, first, um, it's, it's, there's not really a re reason why manipulation is undesirable, um, but it's actually a reason why you may think, well, there's not really much we can do about it, because manipulation is virtually impossible to, de to detect, as, because as I mentioned earlier, we don't know the true preferences. It's not really possible to tell in most cases um, whether, what the real preferences of a certain individual are. And uh, there's a famous quote by the Chevalier de Bordas, uh, which is a, a scholar um, who lived in, in France during the time of the French Revolution, and we will get to back Bordas later. Of course, he proposed Bordas' voting rule, which we learned about in the first lecture. Um, and when it was pointed out to him that this can be strategically manipulated, uh, his reply was just, well, my voting rule is only intended for honest men. Um, so at that time, women didn't, were not allowed to vote. Um, uh, therefore, he was just talking about men, but uh, nevertheless, the statement is, of course, a bit ridiculous, so it's, it's not really a good protection against manipulation if you insist that, because we cannot really tell whether somebody is honest about their preferences or not. Um, then, um, a, a reason why, why it should be considered undesirable is because um, um, it, whether you can really manipulate, uh, whether you can represent your preferences in a beneficial way, depends on how much you know about the preferences of the other voters. Right? If you don't know anything about the preferences of the other voters, it will be very difficult to find a beneficial manipulation. If you exactly know what the preferences of the others were, it, it can be quite easy. So there's this information, um, maybe uh, inequality, so that m some people know more about others' preferences, um, or maybe they can invest by spending money to find out more about others' preferences, then these people will have an advantage. 
Um, and at the same time, it's not only about information, but it's also about computation, because we will also see later in this course that uh, computing beneficial manipulations can be quite a challenging problem. So if you, even if you know the preferences of everybody else, it can be quite d uh, tricky to figure out what you should say about your own preference relation in order to get a better outcome. Um, and therefore, people who have access to more computational power by computers, for instance, who are just smarter than other ones, have an advantage. Um, and this could also be considered as reasons why we would want to avoid strategic manipulation. Um, because well, th the resources that are used in order to get this information, in order to compute outcomes, are not evenly spread um, among a population. So maybe some people have more information than others, um, and therefore there's some, some inequality here. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, um, all theoretical statements that we make about social choice functions are basically void if we take into account strategic manipulation, because all these axioms that we are going to show for certain social choice functions, so that a certain axiom is satisfied, for instance, by a social choice function, depends on the assumption that voters are submitting their preferences truthfully. Um, if this is not given, we are computing the outcome for an artificial preference profile, which just consists of manipulated preference relations, and therefore it's very difficult to make any theoretical statements about these functions because it depends on how the voters misrepresent their preferences. And a, a very clear example for this point is the silly rule. Okay? So if you recall, the silly rule was defined with this odd and even uh, distinction, and the way the silly rule is defined is that whenever a voter is unhappy with the outcome, so we have only two alternatives for the city rule. So let's say I prefer A to B and the outcome is B. Okay? If we are using the silly rule, I can just change my preferences because I can switch from odd to even by just making a single change in my preferences and then the outcome will be A. So that means every unhappy voter can change the outcome of the voting rule by just changing his or her preferences. Um, and well, if everything else remains fixed, that, that may, may seem like a good thing, because if, if you don't do this and I'm the only one doing this, I know about the outcome, then I change my preferences and get my more preferred outcome, things would be great. But of course, everybody is a strategic actor and everybody can do this. Um, and therefore, strategically, it's a complete disaster, right? Because everybody, so it's extremely um, responsive, this rule. So any single change in the preference relation will change the outcome. Um, so if you think about Nash equilibria, um, only for those of you who have a rough understanding of what these things are, so there's no pure Nash equilibrium in this kind of game. So you can always change your strategy and get a better outcome. Um, of course, in every game there is a mixed equilibrium, as some of you may know. So if you allow for randomization, which in this case would be that you randomize uniformly between your, both of your possible preference relations, A voting for A or voting for B, um, well, that would be an, a Nash strategy for all of the voters, randomizing uniformly what to vote for. So it's really uh, impossible to make any, any interesting statements about the silly rule if you take into account strategic manipulation. So that is, I think, a, a good point why we would want to have uh, social choice functions that are strategy proof. And as we will see for two alternatives, that can be done. So we can, we can find functions that are strategy proof. A strategy proof we are going to define means you are not better off by manipulating. But once we move away and have more than two alternatives, there are these strong impossibility results, which I think I also mentioned in the first lecture. Um, one thing that I forgot or that I think can be quite instructive, I don't know, did I mention US presidential elections in the first lecture when we talked about manipulation, where you have this third candidate? Um, I did? Ah, okay, so maybe, maybe this is not necessary anymore then. So it's, um, then, yeah, okay, so let's, let's not draw anything, but it's, it's a very simple example where you see that manipulation is not really a bad thing, but maybe even a clever thing to do. So if you think about the US presidential election in 2016, so there were um, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, and then there was also a libertarian candidate that maybe many of you don't know about. He was called Johnson. Okay, and um, some people voted for this person, <laughs> but it was pretty clear from, from all the polls that this person had no chance of being elected the president of the United States. Um, and since he was a libertarian candidate, many of these voters who favored this candidate, Johnson, had as a second choice uh, Hillary Clinton and then Donald Trump. Just because, so there was a similar scenario in 2000 where there was um, Bush, um, Al Gore, and then there was a green candidate, Ralph Nader, and usually people who like green candidates prefer the Democrats to the Republicans. And, and for those people who had these preferences, so if you had Johnson as your top choice, and then uh, Hillary Clinton, and then Donald Trump, 
like voting for Johnson is really just a waste of, of your vote because he, this person has no chance of being elected. If you lie about your preferences and, and state that your top choice is Hillary, uh, is Hillary Clinton, um, then you can get an outcome in theory that is better to the outcome that you would have gotten otherwise. And uh, sadly, for this pre presidential election in 2016, it wasn't only in theory, um, because um, uh, this was a very tight election, as, as many of you will know. So Hillary Clinton also won the popular vote, so, which clearly shows that anonymity is violated. So there were more voters who voted for the Democrats than the Republicans. Nevertheless, the Republican candidate won. But this is not the first time this has happened in the US because of the Electoral College. But since it was so narrow, so if, if all of these voters who voted for this libertarian candidate would have lied about their preferences, they may have changed the outcome in the end. So. Um, I think this is a, like a real-world example which clearly shows that manipulation, in contrast to what the name suggests, is not really like an illegal activity. It's really just, and, and I guess many of you, when you were voting in elections, have made similar um, thoughts. Um, if, you, if you think about the possible election outcomes, then in many cases, um, you will be better off by lying about your preferences. Okay, so the um, point of all of this is that it would be nice if we have social choice functions that cannot be manipulated. Okay, um, so now if we want to formally define strategy proofness, we have a bit of a problem. I think this is also something that I briefly alluded to in the first lecture, because the outcomes of social choice functions are sets of alternatives, but all we have are preferences over single alternatives. So that means if, uh, let's say, the outcome of a social choice function is set A, B, um, and then I can change my preferences and then the outcome would be BC, so it's not exactly clear which set I would prefer, no matter what my, my preference relation is. Um, and therefore, at some point later in the lecture, we are going to extend preferences to sets over alternatives. So there are some very clear-cut cases, for instance, if you have the preference relation ABC, for instance, then the set AB you would probably also prefer to the singleton C. Right, because both of these alternatives are, are better than alternative C. But there are some other cases where these are overlapping, where it's not exactly clear which set you would prefer. But these things are tricky, and there are many different ways of defining preferences over sets. Um, therefore, for now, we make the simplifying assumption that preferences, uh, that when we define manipulation, that we only take into account preferences over singletons, because these are the clear-cut cases we know. So if somebody can go from singleton A to singleton B, and this person prefers B to A, this is a manipulation, then this person is better off. Whenever sets are involved, it doesn't count as a manipulation. So it's a very simplifying a function because, uh, assumption because we are basically ru ruling out any comparisons between sets. Um, okay, so formally what we are doing is we are extending the preferences over the alternatives to preferences over singletons. So we only get these curly braces and all sets that are not singletons are not comparable. Um, another simplifying assumption that we are making um, is that this voter that wants to manipulate knows the preferences of all the other voters. Okay, so that, that seems like a rather restrictive assumption because in reality this is clearly not always the case that you know the preferences of everybody else. But for a theoretical analy analysis, of course, it's, it's, it's almost necessary because if you don't know the preferences of the others, you don't know how the outcome might change. Of course, you can have a more sophisticated model where you have probability distributions over the preferences of everybody else and then you can say, if I change my preferences, maybe with a certain probability I will get something better. But here we just for now take the simplest case uh, where this voter knows the preferences of everybody else. Um, as I think I also mentioned in the first lecture, this is not completely um, unrealistic in some settings because you can have, for instance, uh, elections in a committee where there's only maybe five or ten persons that are discussing a set of issues. Um, and before they go to the vote, they are discussing the, the different possibilities. And in many cases, during this discussion, it becomes pretty obvious what the preferences of the individuals are. And then you know, okay, so hmm, it seems like many people are in favor of this thing or in the other thing. And therefore, if I change my preferences, then I can get something better. Um, and perhaps the more convincing reason for making this assumption is, is that if we assume or if we, if we prove that a social choice function cannot be manipulated under this assumption, this only makes the statement stronger, right? Because it cannot be manipulated even if everybody knows the preferences of everybody else. 
So therefore, I think that is a good reason for making this assumption because in the end we will find functions, at least for the two alternative case, which uh, satisfy this condition. And that means even if you know the preferences of everybody else, you cannot manipulate. If you don't know the preferences of everybody else, of course you can still not manipulate. Um, so it only makes the statements stronger. Okay, now the formal definition. Um, let's go over it line by line. So a social choice function is manipulable. Oops is manipulable by some voter i if there are two preference profiles r and r prime and a feasible set a such that these two profiles are the same for all voters except voter i okay so recall that these preference profiles we usually just write as vectors of preference relations one for each voter okay so these profiles are the same for all voters except voter i so only voter i changes her preferences and then the following should hold the outcome under profile R prime is strictly preferred by voter I to the outcome under profile R. Okay, so that means that this voter changes her preferences in order to get something better. It's important here to really take the original preference relation here and not the one with the prime, right? Because that is the manipulated preference relation. So according to her true preferences, this voter prefers the manipulated outcome to the original outcome. Okay, so if, if something like this is possible, then a social choice function can be manipulated. And now we take the negation of this property because we want functions to be non-manipulable. Right? So a function is strategy proof if it cannot be manipulated by any voter. Okay, so that is an, another axiom that we would like to be satisfied. Functions ideally should be strategy proof. So in today's lecture this, this will work quite well. Unfortunately, in the upcoming lectures, it will be very difficult to, to get functions that satisfy this condition. Okay, um, that's the definition of strategy proofness. And I think now we are getting back to monotonicity. So I forgot about this interlude. Um, Okay, monotonicity and strategy proofness are connected to each other. Um, we will make this formal in a theorem in, in a couple of minutes. But for now, let's just recall the intuitive definition of monotonicity from the first lecture. So if alternative A is returned, it still needs to be returned if it is reinforced, which means that it's just rising in the preference relation of one of the voters. So it's only getting better, then it should still be returned. Um, I think this is a pretty good example of how tricky formal definitions can get when you make things formal. <laughs> um, because uh, especially now that we also allow for weak preferences, there are many, it's, it's not exactly clear what, or we, have to, we have to take care of how we define that A is reinforced. So it could be that A is moved strictly on top of another alternative. It could be that it's just moved on the, to the same level so that maybe B is on top of A and then a is, uh, we are now indifferent between A and B, so that would also mean that A is being reinforced. Um, or it could be the other way around, that, um, that, um, a and, that we were indifferent between A and B, and now we are moving A on top of B. Okay, so because of these different possibilities, the formal definition is a bit tedious. Maybe you have seen it already in the PDF. Um, this is not even the complete definition, so this is a part of the definition that we are using for monotonicity and a strengthening of monotonicity. Um, so let's, let's see what this is about. Okay, so we have two preference profiles, we have a voter, we have an alternative. So again, so for, for formalists here, so I'm not writing that these are preference profiles taken from the domain D of U or something, because whenever I take R and R prime, it will always be preference profiles. Okay, so then we have these two preference profiles. They are the same, except that the preference of one voter changed. And now the following condition here needs to be true. For all pairs of alternatives x, y different from a, the relationship between x and y needs to be the same in, in both profiles. Okay, so that just says that um, the relationship between alternatives other than x is not changed. Okay. It's not that we are moving some x above some y or the other way around, so those remain the same. Then everything that was weakly below A is uh, that is still below A in the new preference profile. And um, everything that was strictly below A is, is uh, still strictly below A. Uh, 
I think these should be implications here. I think I made a mistake here. Okay, so let's just... So I reset most of these formulas using LaTeX this semester, and I think I made a mistake here. Okay, so everything that was, that was below A should still be below A in the new preference profile, and everything that was strictly below A should still be strictly below A, So because otherwise the preferences wouldn't change. Um, now, what this ex uh, specifically allows is that A is rising in the preference relation of this voter I. Um, and this is precisely what we want to have. Okay, so this is just... So all of this here... <laughs> It's just the formal way of saying that A is being reinforced in the preference relation of voter I. Or it's rising in the preferences of voter I. Okay, and now monotonicity says that if A was among the winners, then A should still be among the winners. Okay, so this is precisely what we had in the first lecture, only in the formalized version. Um, and intuitively, it's really clear that this condition should be satisfied, right? So if, if we're only making an alternative stronger and we're not changing anything else, that's the only change that we are making, then it should still be returned. Now, there's a natural strengthening of monotonicity, which is called positive responsiveness, which works as follows. Um, it says that if A was among the winners, and if we changed something at all, because this here would still allow for two preference profiles. So this up here would still allow for two preference profiles that are exactly the same. So if we are making some change, if the preference profile changed from R to R prime, so that means we really, really strictly made A stronger against some alternative, um, then A should be the unique winner. Okay, so note the difference here is that here we have that A should be the unique winner, whereas here A should only be among the winners. So the, the idea of positive responsiveness is, is that if A is A best alternative, and then we are making A stronger without changing anything else, then A should be the unique best alternative, because if there was some kind of tie before, we have broken this tie by making A stronger. So that's the intuition behind positive responsiveness. Right? So it, um, it only makes a difference if A is really among the winners. So if this is a set here, um, uh, sorry, if, if this is a set here, um, because then we are saying, if a is a winner, and maybe some alternative B is a winner as well. If you are making A stronger, then A should be the unique winner. Okay, and clearly, therefore, the condition of positive responsiveness is stronger than monotonicity. Okay, so now we have these two different notions of, of monotonicity. And here, as I said, the idea is if A is chosen, then it's chosen uniquely when it is being reinforced. And now the promised relationship between um, strategy proofness and monotonicity, which uh, only works for resolute social choice functions. So I'm now claiming that a resolute social choice function on two alternatives is strategy proof if and only if it is monotonic. Okay, so these conditions, so I said that they are related to each other. If we restrict attention to resolute social choice functions and we only have two alternatives, which we do have for, for most of today's lecture, then these two um, conditions are equivalent to each other. So actually three of these conditions are equivalent to each other because the positive responsiveness is also the same thing as monotonicity if you have resolute social choice functions. Uh, this is hopefully clear, right? So because, if, if, because um, there will always be only singletons here. Okay, so we, if we can only, only uh, choose singletons, so A being an element of the choice set is the same thing as saying A has to be the unique winner here for resolute functions. Okay, so and, and this is quite useful because it means that we can um, like analyze strategy proofness just by analyzing monotonicity. So it's um, um, strategy proof social choice function is just the same thing as a monotonic social choice function. Okay, so and this we are proving now, unless there are questions regarding so there were a couple of definitions now, um, at least hopefully on an intuitive level. These are clear. If not, maybe you need some more time to looking at the formalisms um, of, of, of these definitions. But I think so. Monotonicity means reinforcing A only. And if A was a winner, it's still a winner. And positive responsiveness has this extra thing of making it a unique winner. But what we want to show now is that strategy proofness and monotonicity are equivalent to each other. And in order to show this, um, 
So this is again an if and only if statement, and I said in the last lecture, I think, that in most of these cases we go first one direction, then the other direction, and this is a simple case where we can prove both directions at the same time. So if you carefully look at the definitions, you can actually see that these are exactly the same thing. Um, and for, to see this, um, let's look at two different uh, preference relations. So because that is what the definitions of monotonicity and um, spread edge proofness have in common. We have two different preference, uh, not preference relations, two different preference profiles which are identical except for the preferences of voters I. So this is a part of both monotonicity and strategy proofness. Okay, so that's for all J different from I. The preference relations are the same. And then um, the trick now is that we want to show the equivalence of monotonicity and strategy proofness. And especially with strategy proofness, it's easier to work with the negation. So if you think how we define strategy proofness, we just said that it means that it's not manipulable. Um, and with monotonicity, it's also easier to work with the negation of monotonicity, which means that monotonicity is violated. Um, so if strategy proofness is violated, it means that we can go from, and we are talking about resolute functions now, that we can go from one singleton A to another different singleton outcome B in an unfavorable way. And the lack of monotonicity is exactly the same thing. So alternative A is the unique winner, so we are talking about resolute functions, and then we are reinforcing A, and then suddenly B is the unique winner. Okay, so working with the negation of monotonicity and strategy proofness and showing that these two are equivalent to each other is the same thing as showing that strategy proofness and monotonicity are the same. So what we are showing is that not strategy proof is equivalent to not monotonic. And therefore, um, we pick these two preference profiles such that in the first profile, alternative A is selected. And in the second profile, alternative B is selected. Okay, so and now if we look at what it means that monotonicity is violated. Okay, so this symbol is just a not symbol. So monotonicity is violated. Um, if, so we have this preference profile R and this preference profile R prime. And now um, first A is selected and then A is not selected. Now we have to make sure what it means that A is being reinforced because the difference between R and R prime is that A is somehow moving upwards. Okay, so and there are a couple of possibilities here. So it could be that B was first strictly preferred to A and now A is weakly preferred to B by this voter I. Or it could be the case that B was weakly preferred to A Uh, well, actually, do I need this? No, let's just drop these. These are not important. It could be uh, that B was weakly preferred to A, and now A is strictly preferred to B. Okay, so these are the two possible cases that we have. And just to, to, get, to get some intuition here, so we have these two preference relations of voter I. And now there are basically three different possibilities how you can make A stronger if you have weak preferences. So th this, if you have strict preferences, it's pretty clear. So A was on top of uh, A was below B, and now it's on top of B. If you have weak preferences, there are basically three cases. So maybe B was on top of A, and now you are indifferent. Or two, um, B was on top of A, and now you are making the complete switch um, that A is now strictly preferred to B or the remaining possibility you were indifferent to begin with, and now you prefer A to B. Okay, so that would also be a reinforcement of A. You have now moved A on top of B. And the first two cases I captured by this part here. Okay, B was strictly preferred to A, and now A is weakly preferred to B. And um, the last two cases are captured by this part here. So this is not, an, uh, so these cases are non-exclusive. Okay, so they actually overlap. So the second case is covered by the first line and the second line. So they are non-exclusive. 
exclusive cases. Okay, but the idea is this, this is like the formal way of writing down that A was being reinforced against alternative, against alternative B. So there's three different cases, and if you want to formally write it down, we, could, we can do it like this here. Okay, and now, um, so what I've written down now is just really just the definition of a failure of monotonicity. Right, so first the outcome was for a resolute function. First it was A and then it was B under these given conditions here. Yes? Oh yes, oh yes, thank you. Of course, thanks. <laughs> okay, um, so that shows me that you're still following, which is great, so it's, um, I hope it is correct now. Yes, so this is the definition of a monotonicity failure. So we go from singleton A to singleton B, even though A has been reinforced. And now to complete the proof of this statement, it's actually very simple, um, because what I now claim is just that this is exactly the same as a violation of strategy proofness. So SP, I will usually, I'm just lazy, so I will just write SP for strategy proofness most of the time. This is monotonicity. Um, and I'm claiming that this is exactly the same thing as a failure of strategy proofness. Okay, so let's see what, what is a failure of strategy proofness. So it means that the function can be manipulated. Okay, so the first case would be that somebody manipulates from A to B. This person, in order to really count as a manipulator, would need to prefer B to A, right? If you like B better than A, the original outcome was A, and then you change your preferences, um, and then the outcome would be B, um, then this counts as a manipulation. Okay, this is exactly what is happening here. So you strictly prefer B to A, then you don't strictly prefer B to A anymore. So we, I'm not saying how these preferences change here, but you're not strictly preferring B to A here. Um, then you get alternative B, which you like better. Um, this is the first part. And the second part is the tricky one, um, or maybe not, not that tricky, but um, um, for the second line here, you can think of as a manipulation where the true preferences are the ones in R prime, and the incorrect preferences or the manipulated preferences are the one in preference profile R. Okay, because you are manipulating in the other direction. So you're starting with R prime, and this voter I here is submitting his true preferences, then the outcome is B. Um, but this voter doesn't like, in the preference profile prime, so here now this prime is important, he doesn't like alternative B, he likes A better. So in the other preference profile, um, his preferences have changed, and now the outcome is uniquely select A, okay, which is a manipulation from R prime to R. Okay, so the first line here corresponds to a manipulation from here to here. The second line corresponds to a man manipulation from here to here. Um, and then we have exactly covered what a violation of strategy proofness means. So a failure of strategy proofness is exactly the same as a failure of monotonicity. Um, and that shows that for resolute functions, monotonicity and strategy proofness are identical conditions. So maybe the proof could be a bit more formal, but in the interest of time, I think this, this hopefully is enough information to convince you of the statement. Now let's get back to the slides. Um, so for resolute functions, these conditions are equivalent. And a simple consequence is if we now again move back to irresolute functions, so we also allow sets of alternatives to be returned, the same kind of argument can be used to show that um, monotonicity implies strategy proofness, but not the other way around. So only one of these directions holds. I guess you have a question regarding... Ah, okay. Okay, so the question is, in the definition, so here why we are not fixing the strict preferences um, between X and Y. So if we fix the weak preferences for all alternatives X and Y, we can also turn them around. We can also, because this has to hold for any pair of X and Y, we can also exchange X and Y. If we fix the weak preferences, then the strict preferences are fixed as well. Because the strict preferences are, can be directly deduced from the weak preferences. Okay. <laughs> 
because as I as mentioned in the last lecture, I think so the strict preference relation we can immediately get from the weak preference relation and the other way around. But but this statement here means that the strict preferences have to be the same as well. And here again, now this has vanished, so I'm going to correct this. So this has to be an implication from left to right only. Okay, um, right. So now this point here. Um, so I'm saying that for irresolute social choice functions, only one direction holds. Monotonicity implies strategy proofness, but not the other way around. Um, but this is really just for the fact that um, uh, the way we define strategy proofness for irresolute functions means that non-singleton sets cannot be compared. Okay, so that means um, we can have an irresolute social choice function which always returns at least two alternatives, no matter what the preferences are. Well, then nothing will be a manipulation because voters can only manipulate from one set containing at least two elements to another set containing at least two elements. So those will be incomparable. So this function, any, any such function is strategy proof. But of course, you can easily imagine some functions like this, which are not monotonic. Um, and therefore, the, for irresolute functions, we only have the direction from right to left, okay, but not the other way around. Okay, um, now we get to the, yeah, I guess, the, the main theorem of, of today's lecture, um, because the, the Condorcet paradox, which we will do afterwards, is, is a very simple proof. Um, and that is May's theorem. And what Bayes' theorem says is that majority rule is the only social choice function on two alternatives that satisfies anonymity, neutrality, and positive responsiveness. Okay, so this is what I promised before the break. So we have an, an, these two uh, fairness conditions plus an extra condition, which in this case is positive responsiveness. So we will see uh, that monotonicity is not sufficient. Maybe you would have preferred monotonicity here, but it really requires something like positive responsiveness here. And once we have this third condition, we have a complete characterization of majority rule. And I'm not sure whether I mentioned this in the beginning of this course, but I'm going to repeat it all the time. So these complete characterizations are really the highlights of, of social choice. So there are some impossibility results where we have a certain set of axioms that are incompatible. There are sometimes results where we will have an entire class of functions that satisfy a given set of axioms. But here um, we have three axioms and only one social choice function which satisfies the axioms. So that's a very strong justification for using this function. Yes? Yes. That's so, like they also satisfy only for, yes, for two alternatives, they satisfy all these. Actually, this is, I think this is in bullet on, on this slide, so it's, it will be coming up later. So, uh, but yes, but I think that's only another justification for majority rule, right? So it's, there are all these different functions that have been proposed, and I showed you in the first lecture that they can give very different results for the same preference profile. But if you go down to two alternatives, they are all majority rule, which I think is, a, apart from this theorem, is, a, is another reason for saying that majority rule is really important. Um, it's, it's not very surprising, right? So also this theorem, I guess, is not completely surprising. If, even before you had taken this course, if, you have, if I would have asked you, so think of a voting rule for two alternatives, it should be symmetric with respect to voters, symmetric with respect to alternatives, and in some sense reasonable, so um, then probably most of you would have suggested majority rule. Um, but nevertheless, so this theorem is also quite, quite old. As you can see, it's from 52. I, it's, it's a nice formal justification for, for using majority rule. Um, and we are going to prove it. But this time the proof will be, maybe let me move this around a bit. The proof will be it's like, a, like a graphical proof. Oops. OK. And it works as follows. So we have these three conditions that we are allowed to use, anonymity, neutrality, and positive responsiveness. And um, the first thing that we are doing is that we are going, so once we know that the function that we are looking at has to be anonymous, we can restrict attention to how many voters strictly prefer A to B, how many strictly prefer B to A, and how many are indifferent. So we again have weak preferences. So for strict preferences, the, the proof is even simpler, but we, will al we also want to allow for weak preferences to have a more general statement. Um, and that means um, the only important part of a preference profile is how many voters prefer strictly one alternative to the other, um, and how many of them are indifferent. 
And so that means we have three different possibilities for each of these uh, preference relations. That's why, maybe let's zoom this, zoom this out here, or in. Um, we can depict a preference profile as a point um, on this uh, face here. So it's a, a triangle in three-dimensional space. So on the x-axis, we have the number of voters who prefer B to A. Um, on the y-axis, we have the number of voters who are indifferent between A and B. And on the z-axis, we have the number of voters who strictly prefer A to B. Okay, but any, every voter has to have uh, a preference relation which falls in one of these three categories. That's why the total number of voters will always add up to N, and therefore all the relevant points here are exactly on this triangle here. So it's like a discrete simplex, if you want to call it that way, because well, we have a discrete number of voters, so this consists of a finite number of points depending on how many voters there are. Okay, so and, and this is already where this proof or proof uh, sketch is using anonymity. Okay, because well, we are not making distinctions between the voters, we are only counting. And what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm taking this triangle and I'm drawing it in two-dimensional space and I'm also drawing it in a discrete way um, and that will result in a figure like this here. Okay. This is for the special case where we have three different voters but um, the proof works exactly the same even if you have any other number of voters. So here this point corresponds to a, so each of these circles here corresponds to a preference profile. So this is the preference profile where all voters strictly prefer A to B. This is the preference profile where all voters strictly prefer B to A, and this is the one where all voters are indifferent. Okay. And how about this one here? So what does this preference profile represent? Yes? Exactly, yeah, so it's, it, one, is, one is indifferent, one strictly prefers A to B, and the third one strictly prefers B to A. Okay, so of course there's also, like if you look at the paper, of course they're they are doing this formally without any, any uh, illustrations, I believe, but I, I think this is a proof where it's much more insightful to look at this kind of figure um, and to see how these axioms actually work together um, in, a, in a sort of graphical way. Um, okay, so let's start for instance, by looking at this preference profile here. Okay, so the, the idea is now for this proof that I want to fill the circles with the choice set, the, the, num the set of alternatives that we are choosing in each of these preference profiles. Because majority rule is one specific function which only leaves a single choice for each of these preference profiles, and now I want to fill these sets with the corresponding um, choice sets, and then that will convince me that the only function that works is majority rule. Um, now, if we only use these axioms here, um, what can we say about this particular preference profile here? So this is a preference profile where all the voters are indifferent between A and B. Okay, and now that means there are th three different choices. Okay, let's write it formally as sets. Okay, so these are the three possible choices we, had, we, had, we have for each of these. Um, we have for each of these preference profiles. So, taking into account the axioms that we have, can we already narrow down the choice for this preference profile? And if so, why? So, what happens if, if, I, if I now claim, okay, here we return alternative A? Would that already contradict one of the axioms? Anonymous, that would be? Pardon me? Yes, neutrality. Okay, so what would neutrality imply if we have a as a singleton here. Okay, so if we, for two alternatives, there's only one permutation. If we permute A and B, then um, the outcome should change accordingly. So that means all the voters are indifferent between A and B. We are permuting A and B. That will result in exactly the same preference profile, right? So if you're indifferent between A and B or B and A, it's a symmetric relation. It doesn't matter. So, and the outcome should change accordingly. So the outcome should be singleton B. So if we only return A here, we also have to only return B here, which is a contradiction, okay? So that's not possible. So therefore, we cannot fill in singleton A or singleton B. And well, that only leaves one choice. Uh, okay. Um, which is to select both alternatives A and B. Right. And that is also consistent with neutrality because, well, if you are renaming the alternatives, well, the set AB will still be the set AB, 
Okay, and the same kind of reasoning also works for this profile here because it's completely symmetric. So one voter prefers A to B, one prefers B to A, and one is indifferent. If we are renaming the alternatives, we get exactly the same preference profile under the assumption of anonymity, which is like inherent in this picture here. Um, um, therefore, only, the only choice is that we are returning alternative, uh, the, the set AB. Okay, so that we get from neutrality. And now let's use positive responsiveness. And for this, it is important how these different profiles are connected to each other. And this is what these little gray markings here mean. So if we go from this profile to that profile here, only the preference relation of one voter changed. In particular, it means that one voter who strictly preferred B to A is now indifferent between A and B. Okay, so we are moving away from this B to A point, and we are moving towards this indifference point, so that means one voter who strictly preferred B to A is now indifferent. If we move from here to there, one voter who strictly preferred B to A now strictly prefers A to B. So we again have these three cases that I mentioned earlier, how we can reinforce an alternative. So these three arrows all correspond to making A stronger against B. So we can move from a strict preference to indifference, or we can just exchange the ordering, which is being done here, and then we can have an indifference in the beginning, and then move to a case where A is strictly preferred to B. So these are the th three different possibilities how we can reinforce A. Okay, and, and that means if we have positive responsiveness now, if all these three things are possible like strengthenings of A, what do we need to fill in here? Yes, A. Right, so it's, if it was only monotonicity, it could also be the set AB. Uh, and here you can already see why monotonicity is not sufficient for the theorem. Um, so for instance, for the theorem, we could also have the function that always returns AB. That would be a monotonic function. It's anonymous, it's neutral, but it's not majority rule. It's, it's the constant indifference function. Um, okay, so there, so we have A here, A here, and A here. Okay, and then of course we can go even further because now we have the same kind of manipulations if we have A here. So there are two different possibilities now how we can get here. We can go from here or we can go from here. Um, it would still be A, of course. So, um, Okay, and now, well, there's two different ways of, of completing the proof. Um, well, maybe even more than two, but so we could of course do the same thing on the right-hand side. Okay, so because then these gray markings here are just going in the other way, so that means reinforcing B, reinforcing B, reinforcing B, then we have Bs here. But we could also use neutrality directly, right? Because what neutrality means, and I think this is why this figure is a bit useful, is neutrality specifically means that we can have a symmetry axis here in the middle. Um, and whenever we have an A on the left-hand side, we should have a B on, in the corresponding position on the right-hand side. So the, the figure should be symmetric um, in this sense. So that means we have to have Bs here and also a B here. Okay, but alternatively, we could have also used positive responsiveness. But neutrality is definitely required for the theorem because otherwise we wouldn't have gotten this or this in the beginning. Okay, so that, that's why it's important. Um, and that completes the proof. And by the way, so since I mentioned neutrality is, re is required, so one of the, I think the first exercise on the upcoming sheet is to show that for this characterization, all three conditions are required. Anonymity, neutrality, and positive responsiveness. And um, I think we have also done this uh, in some related exercise earlier where you were asked to show that alpha does not imply gamma and gamma does not imply alpha, and it's the same thing here. So we, you need to show that two of these conditions do not imply the third one, which means that you show that they are independent from each other. That means for each of these conditions, you have to find a function that violates this given condition and satisfies the other ones. Okay. Um, yeah, some examples we already discussed in the lecture, so this exercise shouldn't be extremely difficult. Okay, and hopefully you can also see that, well, I chose n equals 3 here, so if you have any other number of voters, the same argument would work. So if you have an even number of voters, it looks a bit different here, but we still have um, preference profiles directly on the symmetry axis. Um, yeah, I guess, even though I called it a proof sketch, I think it's basically, it's basically a proof. So I, probably so for, for an exam or an uh, exercise question, it might be a bit difficult to, to assess something like this because it's not clear um, what you meant when you were drawing this. But uh, for the lecture, I hope it's okay because I think it gives a nice intuition how these axioms work together. So anonymity means 
that we use this anonymity was exploited by just using the representation. Neutrality means that we have the symmetry axis here and positive responsiveness means if we are going one direction and we had an A, so we will only have unique A's in this direction and only unique B's in the other direction. Okay, that's May's theorem. Um, and there are also some variants of this theorem. Come on. Okay. Um, so if you don't like positive responsiveness because it is too strong for your taste, so clearly it is stronger than monotonicity, you can also choose monotonicity instead and then have the additional requirement that you are interested in um, the most decisive or the, most, the, the finest function that satisfies the axioms. And what do I mean by most decisive? Um, I mean uh, one function is more decisive than another function if it always returns subsets for every given preference profile of what the other function does. So if you think about what you would get if you also allow for monotonicity in this diagram that I just showed you, you would also get functions that in the middle region have indifference. Right? So there would be a larger region where you have indifference, not only the line in the middle, but maybe a larger interval in the middle. Um, and those functions you can rule out by, just, um, have by saying that you should always return the smallest choice set possible, um, and that also gives you a majority rule if you go from if you also have anonymity and neutrality. So you, you can replace positive responsiveness with monotonicity and the extra assumption that you need to return small choice sets so that the function should be decisive. And what you can also do because of the equivalence that I showed you earlier, um, or the implication, because we are talking about irresolute functions now, you can replace monotonicity with strategy proofness, which is another strong motivation for using majority rule. So because monotonicity and positive responsiveness are somewhat technical conditions that people may need some time to get used to, but strategy proofness just means it should not be possible to manipulate the function. So if you want to have something that is strategy proof and fair in the sense of anonymity and neutrality, then there's only majority rule. So it's a nice and, and positive statement, but also not completely surprising, I guess. Um, so now come a couple of, of observations about the two alternative case. Um, so when there are only two alternatives, majority rule is completely uncontroversial. So not only because of May's theorem, so I mentioned earlier that most of you probably had this function in mind. Um, if you insist on symmetry and fairness, all the rules that I mentioned in the first lecture, they all collapse to majority rule for the two alternative case. Um, and interestingly, so we had this also this condition of rationalizability in the beginning, and we will see that it leads to problems when we move on to uh, more than two alternatives. Um, majority rule is rationalizable, but that's not really an interesting statement to make because if you have only two alternatives, every function is rationalizable. Right? Because if you think about what rationalizability means, there's an underlying preference relation that, uh, such that the maximal elements are always chosen. We usually take the base relation because it, it has to be the base relation by lemma two. Um, but the tricky part was that the rationalizing relation needs to be acyclic at least, maybe even quasi-transitive or even transitive if you demand more of this. But all of these conditions require at least three alternatives. So on two alternatives, any relation is acyclic and transitive and quasi-transitive. Right, because well, you, you cannot have a cycle with two alternatives. So therefore, rationalizability is trivially satisfied if you have only two alternatives. So this is a technical note. Um, in the remainder, we will sometimes use weakenings of many of the conditions that I've introduced with a subscript two. And that just means that we only impose these conditions for feasible sets of size two. So for instance, positive responsiveness two, monotonicity two, Barito optimality 2, for instance, that means the condition only has to hold for feasible sets of size 2 for larger. So, for instance, Pareto optimality 2 would still allow that from a set of 10 alternatives, we can choose a Pareto dominated alternative, but not from a two element feasible set. Um, so, this is particularly useful for positive responsiveness because we will see much, much later in the course that positive responsiveness is, is a very demanding condition if we allow for more than two alternatives. Um, and there are some impossibilities that use positive responsiveness as a main condition. Okay, but now let's get to the second important result of today's lecture, and that is the Condorcet paradox. And um, this 
is the first re result that tells us what can go wrong um, if we allow for more than two alternatives. Because as I mentioned a couple of times, for two alternatives, things are great. Majority rule is completely characterized using maze axioms. It's strategy proof, uh, which is very hard to satisfy for more than two alternatives. Everything's great. But once we allow for three alternatives, things can really go wrong. And the main statement showing this is errors in possibility theorem. Um, and the Condorcet paradox, or the version of the Condorcet paradox that I'm showing you, is like a poor man's version of errors in possibility. Because the errors in possibility, which we are going to prove next week in this course here, um, has a rather like, demanding proof. But the Condorcet impossibility or the Condorcet paradox is just a very simple observation about the majority relation. Um, but um, it's a statement that is very closely related to errors and possibility. So it shows you the essence of what can go wrong. And for this, we need uh, one more piece of notation. So the majority relation is just this uh, like. Uh, relation symbol with the subscript M, where M stands for majority, and the way it is defined is just that X is majority preferred to Y if the number of voters who prefer X to Y is at least as large as the number of voters who prefer Y to X. So this is the weak majority relation, which would also allow for majority ties. Okay, so we, we can also have uh, the strict majority relation. I, yeah, I think it will be used later on, but maybe let me show you. Like, like with any relation, we will in some cases also use the strict part here, which is just defined by saying that it should be um, the weak relation from x to y, but not from y to x. Okay. Um, the term majority rule um, we will use in two different meanings, which hopefully is not confusing. So, so far when I said majority rule, I meant the social choice function, which picks the more preferred alternative from two element sets. Um, I will also use the same term, majority rule, um, for this relation that we have just defined. Okay, now to the theorem. So what I'm doing here is like uh, I'm combining, uh, I think this is something that is only being uh, done in this course, at least I haven't seen it somewhere else. So it's I'm combining an observation by Condorcet, which is very old from the 18th century, um, with the, the theorem by May. Um, in order to get a statement that is in some sense comparable to the error and possibility theorem. So what this theorem says is that no anonymous, neutral, and positively responsive social choice function is rationalizable whenever we have at least three alternatives and at least three voters. Okay, so it's uh, an impossibility theorem which uses exactly the same conditions uh, than, that we were using for May's theorem. We add rationalizability on top, which we got for free for two alternatives. So I said every two element function is rationalizable. Now we have at least three alternatives and at least three voters, and also demand rationalizability because what rationalizability means, and this is what we have discussed in detail in the last lecture, is, is that um, the choice by the society is in some sense rational. So there is some underlying preference relation which describes the preferences of the entire society, and the society always chooses the best alternatives according to the society preference relation. Um, and this theorem shows that these conditions are incompatible with each other. And the proof is very simple, so it's just on this slide here. Um, so let's assume that f is a social choice function that uh, satisfies all these conditions. And um, then look, let's look at this particular preference profile here. Okay, so this is what I meant uh, with the essence of also errors in possibility theorem. So this preference profile is something that you will see many times in this course. Um, sometimes this preference profile itself is called the Condorcet paradox. Okay, so it's a preference profile with three alternatives, and you can already see that it's very symmetric. So it's like a magic square thing. So on every row and every column, there's exactly one A, one B, and one C. Um, and uh, since the function that we are looking at is rationalizable, there has to be some rationalizing relation. Okay, so because the function has to be rationalizable, and so let's denote by this symbol here the relation that rationalizes this social choice function. Well, then we know from lemma two from last time um, that statement of that lemma was just if something is rational or something is rationalizable if and only if it is rational but rationalizable by the base relation. So that was the statement where you can, rather than looking at all possible rationalizing relations, you only need to look at the base relation, which, which means you only need to look at pairwise choices. Um, maybe let's do this right here. So this is how we already drew these choice functions. Um, in the last lecture. 
Okay. Um, I hope I can still. Okay. Um, at, at this point, it's not exactly clear how we should make these pairwise choices, but now we are invoking May's theorem because we have these other axioms as well. So we have anonymity, neutrality, and positive responsiveness, two, but we only need it for two alternative sets in May's theorem, which means that pairwise choices are made exactly according to majority rule. Majority rule is the only social choice function on two alternative sets. So that means that the rationalizing relation um, is, or the base relation of this function is the same as majority rule, which we defined up here. So the only possible choice for the rationalizing relation is the majority relation. Okay, so that means if we are choosing from this two element set A, B, we don't need to check whether one alternative is preferred to the other by a majority of voters. Okay, so here two voters prefer A to B, um, two out of three, that's a majority, so A has to be chosen here. From B, C, the first two voters prefer B to C, so B has to be chosen. A, C, the last two voters prefer C to A, so C has to be chosen. Okay, so this is F of A, and this is just A, this is the feasible set. Okay, um, so that uh, is how the base relation is defined, and what you can already see here, and that is really the, the essence of the Condorcet paradox, is that the base relation and the majority relation, which are the same, um, are cyclic. Right? So the, this preference profile defines a majority three cycle. And now what we need to choose from the three elements set here has to be the set of maximal elements according to the, this base relation defined by these choices here. Okay, but I think I, yeah, so here, this is how uh, the base relation looks like. And therefore, what is the set of maximal elements according to this relation here? It's the empty set, right? We cannot choose anything. Um, and therefore, we have a contradiction because the social choice function always has to choose, um, always has to choose a non-empty set. So maybe, yeah, let's do a flash or something like this here. So if you think about it that way, so the Condorcet paradox is just the um, yeah, relatively simple observation that the majority relation may be cyclic. And the other axioms just make sure that we are using the majority relation as a rationalizing relation. Rationalizability requires that the choice from larger set should only depend on the pairwise choices from the majority relation in this case. And since the majority relation is cyclic, we cannot choose anything. And, and that completes the proof of this theorem. Um, and as I said, so it's, it's fairly simple. Um, it's just like a formal way of saying that majority, the majority relation may be cyclic and therefore there may be no maximal elements if you, for instance, want to choose from this three element set here. And um, the reason why I'm showing you this in so much detail is because um, the next thing that we are doing is, is that we are taking these axioms that are used in this Condorcet May impossibility and changing them. So we are making like three axioms much, much weaker and one axiom a tiny bit stronger. <laughs> and then we get exactly Eros impossibility. So this is, this is the reason um, why um, I showed you this in detail. So we are, the, the three axioms that we are making weaker are anonymity, neutrality, and positive responsiveness. And the rationalizability action, we make a tiny bit stronger by requiring transitive rationalizability. Okay. And, and then we get exactly Eros impossibility theorem, which is much more difficult to prove. And because we are making one axiom a tiny bit stronger, these statements are incomparable. So Eros theorem feels much stronger than what I've showed you here, but technically they are incomparable. So three axioms are much weaker and one axiom is, is stronger. But before we get there, um, let me say a couple of other things. So first, Formally for this theorem here, so I'm saying that M is at least three and N is at least th uh, three as well. Um, I've only proved the statement for exactly three voters and exactly three alternatives, but um, those additional voters and alternatives we can easily account for, for, for instance, by adding extra alternatives um, at the bottom here, which we have done earlier as well. And if we want to have extra voters, we can have ex add extra voters who are completely indifferent between all given alternatives, and that will not change the majority relation. We will still have this three cycle between A, B, and C, just, just to complete the statement here. All right, but... Now let's look at this notion of uh, so-called Condorcet winners a bit more detailed. Uh, so this is something that I also mentioned in the first lecture. Yes? Uh, 
Pardon me? Uh, if you have this preference profile, which has what? If it's not cyclic, okay. Um, okay, so if we have a preference profile which is where the majority relation is not cyclic, then for this preference profile we can define a social choice function which satisfies the given conditions. But the problem is it needs to be, so for, the, for this function to satisfy the conditions, it needs to satisfy the conditions for all preference profiles. Right, but it's, so, but this is uh, like, it, it also leads to what we will later call an escape route from, from these impossibility theorems. It's important here that all possible combinations of preferences are allowed. So, we had this domain D of U, which we defined in the beginning. So, all possible combinations of preference relations are, possible, uh, are allowed. Um, in particular, this one here. So, once, once we allow this one here, well, then we have the impossibility. Um, and later, uh, like in maybe I think two weeks from now, we will look um, at cases where we restrict the set of possible preference relations which rules out something like this and then we will get more positive results. Okay, but now Condorcet winners. Um, so an alternative is a Condorcet winner. I think I briefly mentioned this in the first lecture already. Um, if it is majority preferred to any other alternative. Okay, so in the example that I showed you previously with the three cycle, there's no Condorcet winner. A Condorcet winner in this graphical representation would only have outgoing edges. So it's strictly majority preferred to any other alternative there is in this graph. Um, and like many social choice functions um, that we are going to study, pick Condorcet winners whenever they exist. And when there are no Condorcet winners, like in the previous example, they do something else. So for instance, in the previous example, it seems somewhat reasonable to select A, B, and C and declare indifference between these three alternatives. The preference profile was completely symmetric there. Um, um, okay, so when a Condorcet winner exists, so it doesn't always have to exist. This is what the Condorcet paradox shows. So there are some profiles which don't have a Condorcet winner. Whenever it exists, however, it has to be unique. There cannot be two Condorcet winners because while well, a Condorcet winner has to be strictly better in terms of a majority than all the other alternatives, if there were two Condorcet winners, X and Y, both of them would strictly majority dominate each other, So it, which doesn't work, right? So that, therefore, they have to be unique. Now you can ask the question, how likely is it that no Condorcet winner exists? Um, so that I will go over quite quickly now in the interest of time. So um, if we have, for instance, three alternatives and three voters, then and you assume that all the preference relations are uniformly distributed and are strict relations. It can be relatively simply shown that the probability of having a preference profile, if you're just drawing a preference profile at random, um, if you have a, that, a, that you draw a preference profile that has no Condorcet winner, um, is 1 over 18, which is about 6%. So it's relatively unlikely that you have a preference profile without a Condorcet winner under the given assumptions here. Um, if you're interested in how to get this number, you can just ask in the forum. I can show you a simple proof um, which exactly computes this number of 1 over 18. Um, so people have looked at these probabilities more generally. In particular, you can look at the limit probabilities when the number of voters goes to infinity and you fix the number of alternatives. Um, so for instance, if you have only one alternative, well, there's always a Condorcet winner. So there are no preference profiles that have no Condorcet winner. For two alternatives as well, there's always a Condorcet winner. Um, if the number of voters goes to infinity and here, if we have three alternatives, then the number, uh, then the probability converges to nine percent. If we if we let n go to infinity, um, and it turns out that if we have more and more alternatives, then this probability becomes larger and larger, and eventually um, it approaches one um, if the number of alternatives increases. And even if we don't let the number of voters to go to infinity, so if we fix the number of voters to, let's say, three or four or five or something, but we let only the, voter, the number of alternatives go to infinity, this also approaches one. So the, the larger the settings are, the more likely it is that there's no Condorcet winner. So which is uh, like, I'm showing you this because this is an argument uh, to look specifically at the cases when there's no Condorcet winner. Because if there is a Condorcet winner, then things are fine. Um, so only these nasty preference profiles like the one that I showed you earlier are the ones that get us into trouble. Okay, so now I have exactly five minutes left to show you how to get from, Condorcet, from the Condorcet impossibility to Eros impossibility. Um, so I'm not proving the theorem, so the five minutes wouldn't be enough for that, but I can uh, in this time show you exactly which conditions are needed to go from Condorcet to Arrow. Um, Okay, so I said I'm, I'm weakening three conditions. 
The first one is called independence of infeasible alternatives. And this condition just means that we have two different preference profiles, R and R prime. And if the preferences within the feasible set are exactly the same, then also the choices from these two feasible sets should be exactly the same. Okay, so this is what was already included in our definition of neutrality, where I said in the beginning of today's lecture, so this is incorporated in the definition of neutrality. So the choices should only depend on the preferences within the feasible set. So this is a very uh, like intuitive condition, and in this framework where you have varying, feasi varying feasible sets, it's almost like, a, like an, a very essential condition that should be satisfied. And by definition, it's weaker than neutrality. Um, then there's Pareto optimality. I've shown you two definitions of that already. So here's another one, which is also like a, there are many different ways of writing down Pareto optimality. So Pareto dominated alternatives should not be selected. Um, so this definition, uh, this condition we know already. This condition is weaker than monotonicity um, and therefore also weaker than, uh, than positive responsiveness under a, a somewhat technical assumption, which is this assumption here. I'm not going into detail this here and you are uh, actually asked to prove this implication under this extra assumption here on the upcoming exercise sheet. So, but the point is that, is that Pareto optimality is a weakening of monotonicity under this relatively mild extra condition here. So what I'm doing now is I'm weakening positive responsiveness, not only to monotonicity, but even to Pareto optimality. I've weakened neutrality to IIA. And the last missing piece is that I'm introducing the notion of dictatorship. Um, and so a function, a social choice function is dictatorial if there exists a voter I such that um, for all feasible sets and all preference relations, the, if there is an alternative that is most preferred by this voter, okay? So this alternative X is the unique top choice of the preference or relation of this voter. Um, if this is the case, then X has to be returned uniquely, no matter what the preferences of everybody else are. So this, as we discussed earlier, is a very undesirable property. So a social choice function should not be dictatorial, because if it is dictatorial, you can, you're ignoring uh, N minus one preference relations of the voters. So you're only taking into account the preference relation of one voter, the dictator. Um, so you would want a function to be non-dictatorial. And as we have already observed earlier today, non-dictatorship non is weaker than anonymity. So I said that dictatorships are like the most drastic example of anonymity violations. Why is that the case? Well, if, um, if, if anonymity would be satisfied and you do have a dictator, then everybody would be a dictator because you're not making distinctions between the individual voters, but there can only be one dictator, otherwise dictatorship doesn't work. So that's the intuitive explanation of why this weakening here holds. So in summary, what we have done now is this here. So the green conditions are the one that we have in this Condorcet may impossibility. We have, and now it, we go to the orange conditions here, which are the ones used for errors in possibility theorem. We have weakened anonymity to non-dictatorship. We have weakened neutrality to IIA. Um, we have weakened positive responsiveness to Pareto optimality, so this is, there's a little caveat here, so we need this extra star assumption, this technical assumption. And at the same time, we are strengthening rationalizability to transitive rationalizability. Um, so I think that is relatively mild strengthening, whereas these are really much, much weaker conditions here. Um, so for instance, uh, like if you, so I, I mentioned earlier that, so for instance, the uh, for US presidential election, so this function that they are using there, if you want to formalize it, doesn't satisfy anonymity because of the electoral college. So anonymity can be a, a rather demanding condition, um, and therefore weakening this to non-dictatorship is really making this, the theory much, much stronger. Um, you can also think of functions that violate neutrality, but only in very few cases, that in, maybe in some preference profiles you are vi violating a neutrality, otherwise the function is completely neutral, therefore IRA is actually a much, much weaker condition. And that gets us exactly to the statement of errors in possibility, um, which was first proven in 51. Um, and what the theorem says, is that there is no social choice function that satisfies IRA, Pareto optimality, non-dictatorship, and transitive rationalizability. So it's, it doesn't come as a surprise. One minor difference here to the Condorcet-May impossibility, so the Condorcet-May thing required at least three voters. 
and at least three alternatives. Here, at least two voters suffice. So in the beginning of today's lecture, I said um, that the set of voters contains at least two voters, so that is like already hard-coded in the model. Um, so you need one voter less for the impossibility to hold. And also you can make these conditions a tiny bit weaker by um, only requiring them for two alternative fe feasible sets. So Pareto optimality, for instance, you only need for two alternative feasible sets. Also non-dictatorship in IRA, you can make uh, very weak in that respect. So we are discussing this impossibility in detail next week. So I'm going to show you like a one proof sketch, which is r somewhat intuitive and then really complete formal proof of the statement. And then the, the plan for the rest of the course is that we have this very negative result and also some related negative results and we want to get away from these negative results. That means we have to like weaken or take away some of these conditions and then find positive results um, to work with for the rest of the semester. Okay, so that's it for today. Thanks very much for your attention. See you next week.